Hey y'all, hey, welcome back to my channel. It's Christian here. You're tuning in for more of my two cents. If y'all new to the channel, then welcome. Thank you so much for coming over here. Hopefully you'll click around, stick around, and subscribe to the channel. We would love to add you to the two cents crew. Um, I talk about a lot of different things over here on the channel, specifically deconstruction, quitting church, church culture, spirituality, religion, some trending topics that may be in the media and in the news or just socially but you know all in all i just want to be one of the resources maybe even the reason that you learn more that you ask more and that you do more by freeing yourself from the bondage of religion but you know <laughs> if this your first video we're gonna take it nice and slow you came at a right at a good time because i'm gonna be reading an email that I got from a subscriber, so I won't be going to nuck, you know, if you ain't buck. But check some of them other videos that I'm definitely bringing the heat, okay? So you'll get an idea of who I be and what I be talking about. If you are returning to Center, then welcome back, family. Thank y'all so much for joining me for another video. Thank you guys so much for sending in your emails. They have been amazing. I have been enjoying reading them and um, setting aside some time to respond to them. I think that in this space specifically, a lot of times creators, content creators are just, we're, we talk to the abyss. I'm talking to a camera right now. Like I have nobody else in this room with me. Um, and it has to be kind of like challenging, but it's also rewarding because of the people who will watch it and engage with it and respond to it. And you guys do that by sending emails. Some of you do it by commenting. Some of you do it by sharing my videos with other people. And I appreciate that 1000%. I do not take any of it for granted. I do not take the conversation, the dialogue, the feedback, um, the references, the background that some of you all share about your own experiences, I take none of that lightly. And I say that because I know for a fact that if there was a place like this, like physically a safer space for people who are either on a deconstruction journey or don't even know that they should or can deconstruct from religion um, and the bondage that may you know, be on them or that they may be in, if there was a space like this for more people to access or to hear and just know like, my three points, you're not alone, you're not crazy, and God still loves you. That's everything. And I wish that I had a space like this or that I had found a channel like this or a voice like mine during that time that was dark and lonely, confusing, uh, with a lot of questions and a lot of uncertainty. But it's okay. You know, sometimes you got to get healed and whole first to become what you needed for someone else. And so I'm glad that I can do that. None of my videos are steeped in church hurt. None of my not not the recent ones. I don't know. Maybe some of the past ones were child in 2019, 2020, whenever I did my first couple. Um, I don't even think so then because I shared those stories like so freely and I still to this day can share stories of church situations and stop my recording and go eat. Stop my recording and go, you know, play with my kids or read or watch something on TV because I'm so far removed from the world that used to be like an encapsulating force for me from that environment that it no longer has an effect like I no longer feel bound by it I no longer feel what some people in church would say convicted I don't feel convicted about talking about church topics or even church folks because I'm free from it and it's like I now know that they're the ones in bondage I now know that they're the ones with the minds that are twisted and warped and Maybe they'll come into the light one day. Maybe they never will. But either way, they're not bothering me and I'm not going to bother them. Let's get into this email. If you have an email that you want to send, go ahead and send that to me at my2centmatters at gmail.com. That's my2centmatters with an S at gmail.com. I will read it and I will share it here on the platform. And I will always keep you anonymous because... Baby, like I always say, I chose YouTube, you didn't, so there's no need for me to blast you like that. Even if you tell me I can say your name, shout out to Destiny Child, I'm not going to do it. No, I'm not. No, I'm not. No, I'm not. I just like to have that, that, that um, anonymity for the peoples, all right? Okay. All right, so this email starts out with, hey, Mrs. Sargent, I recently ran across your videos, and wow, all capital letters, W-O-W, -W, okay? <laughs> and Wow. They are absolutely incredible. My name is. You tried to get me. You tried to get me to say your name. I see you. 
okay, uh, what name I want to get him? My name is Michael Myers because I'm recording this on October 31st. Who the who? Maybe I should have did a Halloween video. I should have did a Halloween video. Maybe I should. Maybe after this, I'll do a Halloween video and post it on Halloween. Who knows? Okay. My name is Michael Myers. <laughs> but stop it. Let's go with Michael. My name is Michael, and I was an armor bearer for 20 years. Y'all, I am 35. I don't know how old Michael is. But 20 years of being somebody's armor bearer is a long time. That's all I'm going to say. Even the Secret Service man only got to serve the president for four years. Unless he get reelected, and then we had a good eight. Maybe they, do they switch out the Secret Service people for each sitting president? Because you can't like really keep the same Secret Service man because it ain't a secret no more. If I saw you with Obama and then you was with Trump, but now you with Biden. Now, nah, maybe that ain't a secret. <laughs> that is a noticeable service. OK, that's not a secret service. That is a noticeable service. OK, anyway, 20 years. Good Lord, that's a long time. I've never been the church guy. However, the pastor saw something in me. To be his right hand. I bet he did. Over the years, I've had a lot of questions and all my answers didn't sit well with me. All I know is I was the I, I was in the eye of the storm and everything was calm, even though a lot of the time, uh, a lot of my time was spent doing church. COVID actually rescued me. <laughs> when I tell you C19 grabbed so many people up out of church, C19 was like, get up, get up. Get on up, <laughs> get up, get on up. COVID, COVID reached, it got the people out of church, okay? Now, let's be clear. I'm not saying COVID helped the people, but COVID did come get the people up out of church. It was the, it was the reason. Many of y'all got free, okay? That's what I'm saying. But bad, bad C-19, bad. We don't like it but it helped some people get out of church the first sunday after church shut down i woke up saw the sun and panicked because i thought i was late only to realize i didn't have to move hmm. at that time it felt as if 10 trucks had been lifted off of my shoulders i sat down on my couch and exhaled not waiting to exhale honey Huh, okay. Did you set the car on fire next with all of your pastor's suits? Huh? Is it giving little burn? Is it is it getting burned with the you know you gotta look at like she did when I tell y'all Angela Bassett played the out that role. I'm sorry, I'm not here to talk about that. But he said he sat on the couch and exhaled and just took me back to the waiting to exhale. Anyway. I talk to my pastor from time to time and he always asks, when are you coming back? My response is always the same. I don't want to do church anymore. Like you said, just because I left the building does not mean I left the source. Mm, mm, mm. Thank you, Mrs. Sergeant. Thank you so much, Mrs. Sergeant. You are truly a breath of fresh air. Well, somebody, let me get my teacher shade. Because I'm teaching lessons. Work, honey, work. Okay, lessons, classes in session. No, thank you for the email, Michael Myers. Um, <laughs> I'm a clown, y'all. Let me say this. Let me start off by saying thank you for sending this email. I think that this is a great email that gives so much perspective from so many different perspectives specifically the male perspective then the armor bearer perspective then a c19 removed church member perspective there was so much in this one email that baby girl is ready okay i am ready to dig in all right get me the fork and the knife okay so i'm gonna cross my legs on this one okay so let's start with you being a armor bearer for 20 years that is a long time to do anything, to be at a job, to be married, to um, to be a bass player, a drum player, uh, to cook, 
it's it's a long time. It's giving two decades, all right? And it's cool when you turn 20 because you was 10, 10 years before that. So it's like, oh, you just grown. But when you've been doing something for 20 years, when did you start that? And I hope you wasn't in your teenage years because that's really going to upset me because then that's going to mean that the person, that the pastor targeted you to keep you in church probably. But if you started as a young adult and now you're, you know, a little bit more mature in the Lord, um, <laughs> maybe you started at 30 and now you're 50. I don't know. But my thing is, I'm just like trying to get some perspective there because that's a very long time to be doing that. But it also gives insight that even after doing something that long, you can get tired in church and that your gateway out was through the pandemic. And I think that a lot of people have taken for granted that, and by a lot of people, I mean church people, a lot of church leadership took for granted that they just had unlimited access to people prior to the pandemic. And then when people had to stay home because of mandates and government restrictions, the government say was higher than the pastors say. And they took for granted that there would be a voice higher than theirs, that they wouldn't be able to say, thus said the Lord, so you better do what I said. The government's voice is the real daddy God. <laughs> I'm going to say that again. The government's voice is the real daddy God because pastors were livid about members not wanting to come to church. Pastors were pissed to the nth degree about members who did not want to come to church because of health concerns, the risks the amount of people that weren't supposed to be gathering. And you have pastors that were literally saying things like, your faith is weak. Who do you trust? The government or God? You should still come. We can social distance. We'll put on a mask. Or if you wear a mask, you don't really have faith. Who raised y'all? Because it, it, it's giving very much Texas Chainsaw Massacre family. Who says something like that to other adults? People at church. As if though it was really time to be out here testing a disease. With the faith. That don't even have enough to make sure all of us are taken care of in this church. Now I'm supposed to have faith bigger than a mustard seed and still show up to church, social distance and wear a mask or not. But y'all ain't even got enough faith as the pastor to, to step into action, right? Not request tithes and offering, right? Not demand that we sacrifice our lives to show up for you, right? You don't want to exercise that same faith that you and your family or you and your, your needs will get met. You still demand everything of us and have to scare us into doing it. But now I'm supposed to believe in you, in your faith, for me to come to church through a disease, through a pandemic? If you don't get out of here, now I need to lean on my faith to show up so that you can keep getting tired, but you don't have enough faith to say, you know what? Y'all stay home. Y'all keep your family safe. Our elderly people in community and our elderly members, we're going to be dropping off food to you all and picking up your prescriptions. Y'all didn't have enough faith to say, God will take care of the church while the church is closed. Help. I just want somebody to help me understand. That should have been a red flag right there. The way that pastors were livid that people weren't coming to church, it was because they were losing access. They were losing their grip. Their grasp wasn't as strong. But okay. Let's play along like we didn't notice any of this because of these specific reasons. They were not concerned about your faith. They were concerned about their funds. Okay. So you say that you've been an armor bearer for 20 years. That is clearly indicative of a very close relationship with your pastor. I mean, you guys had to be very close because if you were doing that for 20 years and he said he saw something in you, 
and he wanted you to be his right hand, I'm pretty sure he confided in you, told you a lot of things you knew pretty much who he was, not just as a man of God, but just as a man. You probably got to see parts of him that other people didn't, aspects of his character and his personality, which didn't have to be bad at all, but it's just more closer, it's closer than many people ever get to their leader. And so for you to be willing to disconnect after COVID, that says a lot about what that time away did for you. And that's the point I wanna focus on here. When I think about deconstruction, and I've talked about it before in my videos, the number one element that helped me after deconstructing or during the deconstruction journey was the distance. Um, and that's why people, you know, in church will say things like, you stay gone too long, you know what I'm saying? Like, that's how saying gets in and, and you'll be disconnected from the source and from God or you'll be separated. That's their fear. That's their greatest fear that you'll have any time away from them that they will no longer have influence over you. You will start to actually know your own thoughts and hear your own voice and really build your own relationship and see that life is not bad without them in it. Yet instead, you found peace. You found comfort. You weren't anxious. You weren't scared. You weren't stressed. You didn't have to get up and work. You didn't have to get up and serve. You didn't have to get up and perform. All of these things that they tell you are pretty much a rite of passage or that's the expectation of you in church in order for you to prove your salvation or whatever the case may be, those are things that when you stop doing them, they get upset. Not God. <laughs> they get pissed and start wanting to talk about the wrath and the punishment and the hell and the backsliding and, you know, uh, the, the, the curse that you're putting on yourself. They start spewing that vitriol when they can no longer access and control you. It's very clear and plain to see, but everything that you stated here was beautifully stated and shared because I too know what that feeling is like. When you wake up on a Sunday and you no longer have that pressure or that weight on you to get up and hurry up and get dressed and you have to go into that presentation mode of just being on. And as someone that worked in radio and I know what it is to be on as a personality, like you have to be at a certain level of speech, you have to be at a certain level of, you know, uh, conversation, a certain level of awareness, a certain level of just like in character, essentially. If I was at Walmart and somebody's like, oh my goodness, it's Dainty C. I knew your voice when I heard you talking. And I'm like, oh, okay, here we go. Like I had to be on, I had to be my radio personality because that's what they wanted. When you think about church and if you're in any, if you serve in any capacity, you have to be on. If you're a greeter, you have to be on. If you're a, um, if, uh, what's that, that, Praise and worship, you have to be on. If you're a musician, you have to be on. If you're an usher, you have to be on. You have to be on. You cannot be you because you have to be who they need you to be for the new people coming, for the returning visitors, or for the every week members. You can't rest in who you are or whatever may you may have needed to come to get refilled. You got to be on. As an armor bearer, you definitely had to be on. <laughs> clap on, not off. Don't clap again. Stay on. That's misery. Kind of, sort of, yeah, really. Next up, you said that the first Sunday after church was shut down, you woke up and saw the sun and you panicked. I... <laughs> I don't think sometimes people realize when they get upset at people like me who support and condone non-church attendance. I don't think people realize that you being upset by people not coming to church is proof of why people feel better when they don't. Like your anger, your um, the words that you speak, like you know how people say, God will show you who a person is over one little misunderstanding, like, or somebody's character will be truly revealed to you over one little misunderstanding or one little incident. It's like that with church attendance. You can miss one time or a couple of times and then somebody will completely turn on you immediately. And it's like, 
what you're upset about them not doing is proof that there was pressure in them doing it. Like they were probably just doing it to avoid the reaction you're giving them right now. You saying that you woke up and panicked? That was the, the installation. That was the, uh, the downloading. That was the feeling that they had successfully been able to implant into you for 20 plus years that was now coming back up from you pausing or no longer having to operate in that ritualistic experience, you felt panicked because it's like, oh my goodness, I'm late. What are they going to think? What's going to happen to me? Oh my God, I've never missed. Oh Lord, I overslept. That's the fear. It's not God-given fear. It's man-installed fear. It's man-projected fear. It's man-given fear. I'm just saying the very thing that people in church say that you need to do once you stop doing it, you only think about them when you're no longer doing it. You don't think about God. I didn't think about God when I stopped going to church. I thought about people at church. I thought about my mother. I thought about other church members. I thought about my pastor. I didn't think about God one time. Was God not pleased? Was God going to do something to me? Was God not honored? Was God angry? I thought about people because that's where the pressure was coming from, from the beginning with a D. Next up, <laughs> you said at that time, it felt as if 10 trucks had been lifted off of my shoulders. And I actually shared this email with my husband and we were talking and he was like, Christian, I felt the exact same way after we stopped going to church. He said he felt this exact same way. Now, my husband was over the media department. He was over the uh, the music department. He was a praise and worship, not the praise and worship leader, but he was the musician. He was the lead musician, the keyboardist. Um, what else was he over? He was over media, music, and, um, well, yeah, oh, um internet branding he was on the church branding so he did the website he did all of the graphics he did all of the church announcements um all of that was him social media everything was my husband's department and then he ran the media department so again that was the soundboard that was the microphones that was um Oh my goodness, the computers, like when the scriptures were going up on the screen, making sure that the pastor's message it, uh, notes and everything was in the back for the, the teenagers that were um, volunteering on each rotating Sunday. Okay, if it was your Sunday to do the scriptures and stuff, Courtney was the person that put all of that in the computer and told you where to go to find it and uh, put this slide up here, put this up there during offering, make sure that this is on the screen there and where they can give and everything. That was all him. And then the the music. When praise and worship got up there and I was on the praise and worship team, when that went forward, he was the one up there playing the keyboard and, and directing the bass player and the drummer. They was following his lead. We had praise and worship rehearsal every week. That was his lead where we were singing. Our notes, our keys, all of that was going through him. There was a lot for one person to do. We had a smaller church, a smaller ministry that we attended. Um, but those were all of the has to be war. And so he stated that this was what he felt like, you know, when he stopped, when we stopped going, a weight was lifted off of his shoulders. And he said that even if we wouldn't have just stopped going to church forever, he didn't, he never wanted to be on any other auxiliary ever again. Even if we would have kept going to church, he never wanted to play another instrument. He never wanted to be on the media department again. He never wanted to be in the, um, he never wanted to be on the social media branding side of the church either. He wanted to do none of the things that he actually was gifted and skilled in doing because he was burned out. He was tired. It was pressure. It was stressful. And again, when I talk about men not going to church, why men are not in church? It's not because men don't love God or don't care about the word or don't want to be in an environment where other people have, you know, faith or an understanding of scripture or whatever. It's because they're tired of, they tired of being like play with by other men who they're able to sniff out the bull immediately. Men have an innate ability. I've said it once and I'll say it again. They're not sitting under the stuff that mostly only women will. They're not going to. They're leaving. They're not coming. 
You think I'm finna pay you to talk to me crazy? You think I'm finna pay you to pat my hand and slap my hand and tell me, uh -uh, don't do that. Uh-uh, you ain't showing up. Uh-uh, give me this. Uh-uh, do that. Uh-uh, honor me. Uh-uh. Like, no man wants to have another man daddy in him. Like, you ain't finna son me. What is this? <laughs> what is, no. So to read this and to know that you were able to sit back and exhale at that moment where you realized that there was no longer demand on you, that's where your true freedom came. Because you were able to step out of that person's shadow and realize that that was just a race you were running, but you were never going to win. It was never going to be enough. The 20 years you gave, you were going to have to give 20 more. You weren't going to get promoted there's no promotion where do you go next to the pastor there's no promotion after that you're always going to be at that level with those same expectations that same stress that same pressure always trying to perform for someone else that is not God and people wonder and are always talking about idolatry this idolatry that idolizing these people and idolizing them people you as a pastor are being some, you're someone else's idol and you're completely okay with being someone's idol too because last time I checked your fingers work and your feet work you can pick up your own bible or your own tablet you can carry your own handkerchief or your own napkins you can pick up your own bottle of water or your own bottle of juice and take it up there with you too who said that pastors needed somebody to gather their things to take them up there before they speak preach teach or any of that do it yourself but no no how dare i touch my own things before i speak to you somebody has to do that for me i gotta get the mic and start preaching immediately while somebody walks behind me and put my stuff down and organize my stuff for me childish ego okay that's all I'm going to say about that. So reading this gives a lot of insight, again, to how a lot of people after C-19 just didn't return. You saying that your pastor calls you from time to time and asks you when you're coming back. Your response is everything. You don't want to do church anymore. I am tired of doing that. I don't want to do that no more. I don't want to act that out. I don't want to play those games. I don't want to show up for that. I'm good. I don't want to do it. I've spent as much time as I'm going to spend giving you all my life, my freedom. I want to do something different. And that's okay. If you want to go play golf, if you want to join a bowling league, if you want to go paint and sit, if you want to go to brunch every Sunday, whatever you want to do, you can do that. You can do that. Imagine waking up with no, like, no expectations on your weekend, on your Sunday. That feels good. It does. Trust me. I know firsthand, first two hands. <laughs> I know firsthand, first palms, that that feels really, really good. A lot of people probably wouldn't have had the gall, if you will, or wouldn't have had the ability to flat out tell their pastor, I'm tired of doing church. Like, I don't want to do church no more. They just probably wouldn't have told their pastor that. But again, you've got your voice. In that time of being separated from that person, from that environment, from that hierarchy and that like control or that element of superiority and authority, you found your voice as an adult to say, I don't want to do this anymore. Do what you want to do with that information, Pastor. I'm good, love. Enjoy. There's a difference there. So with those elements and that understanding and that opportunity and that option, you exercised it. And that's the difference. Exercising something over people who don't exercise any of these rights, any of these freedoms, any of this liberty, it's a difference. And I just personally, I mean, I think that you deserve a star for saying, I want to do this. Don't call my phone if you don't want me to say the same thing, because I'm telling you again, I don't want to come. I don't want to do church. I ain't interested. You know, take my name off the roll. Get somebody else my spot as your armor bearer to get your juice and your oil and your towel and your tablet and your Bible. Get somebody else to do it. I don't want to do it no more. Respectfully, I don't, I'm not interested. And that is something that, again, a lot of pastors, a lot of individuals, a lot of leaders 
They have not heard that. They haven't been told that. Nobody has exercised that freedom and that liberty to say, I'm good. My season here is over. Let somebody else have the op opportunity. Give the position to somebody else, you know. Um, but kudos to you. Good for you for being able to do that. And I wonder what the pastor's response was when you said that you didn't want to do church no more. <laughs> like, what does one respond to that? Like, I understand, brother. I don't be want to do it no more either, but I ain't got no choice, right? Um, is that like a real talk moment where the pastor is able to say, I understand and I respect that? Or is that an opportunity for a pastor or a leader to then jump into defense or into offense, if you will, and feel as if though you're backsliding or you're no longer connected to God or you're sinning or you're just looking for an out to live how you want? Because that's usually where church folks go when you no longer want to play the church game. They go immediately to you being a sinner, you backsliding, you being out of the will of God. Now you're being open to Satan's attacks because you're no longer covered. They go immediately to that part of it because they no longer have that control over you. So now I need to introduce fear in order to get the control back. It's ghetto all the way around. I do not like it. Zero stars do not recommend. <laughs> okay. Um... And yeah, you just acknowledge me saying that just because I love left the building doesn't mean I love the source. And that is a beautiful way to wrap it up, sum it up, and to be direct about it. I know for me personally, I did not want to do church anymore. I was not interested in doing church anymore. I knew that church wasn't working for me based off of my experiences. And if I was going to be connected to anything, I needed to connect to myself, with myself, for myself with my source and my source was not man my source was never man i was never praying to my pastor i was never praying to my pastor's wife i was never praying to my mother i was never praying to my church pulpit or whatever i was praying to god and i was really separated from god because i was making an idol out of ministry. I was making an idol out of my pastor. I was focused more on man than I was actually my source. I didn't feel good. I, I wasn't happy. I wasn't connected. It didn't feel genuine or authentic. I didn't even feel as if though I had a purpose because everything was coming out of performance. It wasn't coming out of passion. I didn't want to do it. So disconnecting from that environment and from that rat race that I was in, yo, you, the freedom that came after I chunked up the deuces, the freedom that I felt, um, the freedom and the liberty that I feel now being able to connect with my source and not trying to get a prayer through other people and showing up for Bible study and prayer this and shut in that and cry out to God for this and get on the altar and fast and, and do these things. I don't want to do all this stuff. I don't want to spin around five times, jump around, run around, slap five, five folks, give five folks a, a, a high five and sow this seed here and pray there and do this. And, you know, I don't want to do all of what y'all was talking about doing. I just want to do one thing. Be me. Who God created me to be. I see y'all on the other side. That's all I'm saying. So shout out to C19. Uh, the element that freed people up from church. Where they were able to see that I didn't need this. It was like the scales were removed from people's eyes. Where they were like, dang, I really can do more of this without feeling like that. I really, nothing happened to me. I, I ain't die. Like Satan didn't attack me and my body and my family. But that's what people will have you think until you take some time apart and you're like, none of that stuff, everything you said would happen didn't happen. So who the liar? You or the devil? You know how they be saying in church, the devil is a liar. You the liar. Because then none of the stuff you said happened, happened to me. So I wasn't out of the will of God. You were just making up stuff all along. And so I definitely am grateful for you sharing this story, you sharing your insight and for sharing your truth even with your pastor. Um, that you no longer wanted to do church and that should have been an eye opener and I also say and this is a video that I wanted to do for a while but I, I'll never understand how people stay in church for 30, 40, 50, 60 years um, I don't think anybody should give that much time to one space I don't I do not believe that 
I do not believe that you should be at a church for 30, 40, 50, 60 years. That is not a badge of honor. That is actually pretty concerning because if you have not grown or elevated from any of that to not need it anymore or to be able to go out and actually become the light and become the source, I mean, a resource of other people connecting with you outside of the four walls of a ministry, then you have really not grown. You've really not elevated. You've really not learned. You've really not evolved as an individual because you shouldn't have to stay in the same place in order to be effective. You should grow and you should thrive and be doing so well that your roots should become so strong that you reach other people outside of that first place that you started in. And you shouldn't even want to be there for 30, 40, 50, 60 years hearing the same person or a new person say the same thing from the same book with no real revelation or information based off of the experience that you have. That's just me. That's just how I feel. But hey, to each his own, some people stay where they are because of comfort and other people stay where they are because they truly just have not grown. And I'm okay with both of those reasons, but I can definitely say when people are ready to move on, you should not demonize them or make them feel bad or guilty for wanting to do so. We each have our own reasons and our own rights and we should exercise them based off of how they bless or benefit our life. All right? Okay. If you've enjoyed the video, go ahead and like and subscribe to the channel. I love to add you to my Two Cents crew. If you would like to send me an email to read or respond to, I would love to do that. Send it to me at my two cent matters at gmail.com. My Two Cent Matters with an S at gmail.com. Until next time, I'll catch you in the next video. Take care. Bye.